So you probably recognize that in this course we don't talk about individual viruses. That's the course is taught by process because that's the best way I think to learn virology. But last time and today we're talking about individual viruses. And the reason is because these are important infections. Last time we talked about HIV and AIDS, and I've done that throughout this course because it's always been an issue. Today we're going to talk about Ebola viruses, which I didn't address in any previous year of this course, but I think this year they have risen to prominence for reasons you can probably guess. And in these lectures, when we talk about specific viruses, it puts together everything you know. We've gone through the infectious cycle, so whenever I talk about HIV or Ebola virus, Every step of the cycle should be familiar to you, not just structure, the reproductive cycle, but pathogenesis. Now, when we talk about viremia and immune responses and so forth, it should make sense to you. If it doesn't, then I haven't done my job this year. Okay? So we'll talk today about Ebola viruses. Monday will be our last lecture. We're going to talk about using viruses uh, as vectors. Now, I want you to look at this quote here. Does anyone know who Glenn Beck is? He's a character, right? So what the hell is Glenn Beck doing talking about mutation rates of Ebola virus and aerosol transmission? He didn't take my virology course. In fact, he didn't take any virology course. He's just shooting off his mouth to get publicity. I'm going to come back to this issue and show you why Glenn Beck and all the others who said this is wrong. You're in the wrong room. I have yeah, after. You took right. this class last year. All right, so today, these are the questions. What did he say? Another time. Another time. Oh, yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, I want to get to these questions today. What are Ebola viruses? Where did they come from? How do they replicate? How do they cause disease? And can we prevent infection? These are things we've talked about all year. So these all should make a lot of sense to you. All right, the story starts in 1967. Some monkeys are shipped to a laboratory uh, in Marburg, Germany. Uh, and these are monkeys that are going to be used for experiments. And in the process of working with these animals, a number of laboratory workers get sick. They develop what's called a hemorrhagic fever. It's a disease with high fever and bleeding, both internally uh, and externally. And these were acquired from African green monkeys that had been imported from Uganda. All right, so here's the outbreak in 1967. Uh, 32 cases of infection, 23% mortality. So that was the first time we'd seen uh, this kind of disease. And then subsequently over the years, you can see from the 70s, 80s, 90s, through to the present, there have been various outbreaks of the same virus. This has been called Marburg virus in the same family as Ebola viruses, uh, with different case. Uh, what they have on this chart isn't quite right. This is percent mortality, but it really should be case fatality ratio because they're looking at the total number of diagnosed cases, um, the, the number of deaths in the total number of diagnosed cases. We don't know the total number of infections, which would be the mortality percentage. And you can see this is quite a lethal virus, and there have been some substantial outbreaks uh, in parts of Africa. There was even uh, a few cases, in, there was one case in 2014 in Uganda during the Ebola virus outbreak. Okay, so this was a lab acquired infection from apparently from monkeys imported from Uganda. Uh, the next outbreaks of hemorrhagic fever which resembled these were in 1976. They were in two separate locations at the same time. The, the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo and Sudan. There were quite a few cases in both of these outbreaks, and that's, again, the case fatality ratio, 88%, 53%. So in other words, of 53% of the people diagnosed with this infection died. Uh, here's um, DRC, and this is where the, the outbreak in the DRC occurred. The, the DRC outbreak wasn't clear where the first case was. The index case is the first case that begins an epidemic. This wasn't identified. But in Sudan, the index case was in a f among cotton factory workers. And there's some thought that they had contact with uh, forest animals. The infection was spread in this outbreak uh, 
by the use of contaminated needles. So these individuals went to hospitals for care and the needles they use are contaminated. They're not sterilized properly. They're not disposable. And the infection also spread among the families of these workers. They would go home and bring the infection, spread among the families, among friends, and so forth. So this turned out to be a similar virus to the Marburg outbreak, but it was different enough, so it was called Ebola virus. And this was named after a, a small river in the northwest of the DRC, shown by this red dot. You can't see the river there, but there's a river called the Ebola River, and that's where this virus gets its name from. And this, uh, it turns out that these two outbreaks in uh, DRC and Sudan, they're both caused by Ebola viruses, but they were two different strains. And they were called Zaire Ebola virus and Sudan Ebola virus. And these are different outbreaks of these two viruses over the year. Uh, the Zaire is often abbreviated as ZBOV. And uh, here's the first outbreak in 1976. And you can see over the years, uh, quite a few others in different countries and different, involving different numbers of people with various uh, case fatality ratios. And here on the bottom is Sudan Ebola virus, again, first outbreak in 1976, but then being observed uh, in other countries as well. This is the way we call these viruses, by the way, <clears throat> the country of origin and Ebola virus, one word. The only time you can use Ebola space virus is to designate this particular virus, since it was the first one isolated. But you'll see all the time in the press, Ebola space virus, which really, if you're talking about Sudan, isn't correct. Next strain to be identified, there are five different Ebola viruses. It's called Bundibugyo Ebola virus. It was an outbreak in western Uganda in 2007, the town Bundibugyo, it's right here in the red dot. 149 cases, 37 deaths. This is, as far as we know, the only uh, epidemic or outbreak caused by this particular uh, virus, Bundibugyo. The next one uh, was isolated in 1994 from an individual who was dissecting a chimpanzee that had died. This was a chimp that was part of a colony where other members in the colony had developed a hemorrhagic fever. So this is now 1994. We understand what a viral hemorrhagic fever is like, and it looked a lot like human hemorrhagic fever. So they were doing necropsy on these chimpanzees, and this individual got sick while performing this uh, necropsy. And this was an animal from the Thai Forest Park uh, which is in Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire, right here. Uh, that individual recovered, so we have one case of infection with this virus. And then um, a year later in Liberia, a single individual was shown to be seropositive for this virus in the absence of disease. So these are the only two known infections uh, with which is what is now called uh, Ivory Coast Ebola virus. And finally, perhaps, the most famous uh, infections initiated in the U.S. Um, this came to Reston, Virginia, which many of you may know as a tech. Are you from Reston? No? I thought you raised your hand. You are? Next to it? Okay. So Reston is a tech capital, lots of uh, IT people and companies there. But um, in, in 1989, there was a primate facility there, shown here in this picture. And they had gotten a shipment of monkeys, Cinemalgus macaques, or Macaca fascicularis, right there, uh, from the Philippines. These are going to be used for research. And during the transport, a lot of these animals died. And once they reached the lab, a lot of them continued to die, much more than you would expect. And studying these animals, they isolated a new Ebola virus. So they were looking at samples from these animals in the electron microscope, and they saw the very typical filamentous viruses that I'll show you in a moment, and they freaked out because here it is, Reston, Virginia, an affluent suburb, and oh my gosh, we have Ebola virus right here. So uh, this went through the, the, the monkeys and, and killed quite a number of them. In addition, four humans who worked in this primate facility seroconverted. They didn't get sick, but when they took serum from them afterwards, they had antibodies to this virus, uh, 
so apparently they had become infected. Um, <clears throat> and these are the only known people that have been infected with this virus over time. There were subsequently a number of other outbreaks of this virus in different places, Italy, uh, Texas, in the Philippines, again from importation of monkeys from the Philippines. So the monkeys are contaminated with the virus uh, and they infect people. None of these people have died. It's not, it's not clear if this is really an apathogenic virus or not. With four infections, it's really hard to tell, right? Um, you will read in the news people saying that Reston is an apathogenic Ebola virus, but I don't think you can reach that conclusion with only four known uh, human infections. In 2009, this, is, this was found in pigs on pig farms in the Philippines. So this appears to be the origin of the virus somewhere in the Philippines. We don't know what the reservoir is. It's never been identified. It's clearly not pigs that are grown for food. Um, and there haven't been any recent infections with this virus. So that's Reston Ebola virus. And this summarizes the outbreaks that we've just gone through in a very brief manner, starting, uh, in, this is now Ebola virus. We're gonna leave the Marburg viruses behind. We're not gonna talk about those today, but from the first uh, outbreak uh, in, in the 70s through the present, you can see outbreaks of different sizes. The numbers indicate the number of infections. Some are a few, some are hundreds, but really less than 2,000 total infections, of course, until uh, last year when the count, as of yesterday, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, in Liberia is over 26,000 confirmed cases. You can see here there was a big gap in the middle here where we didn't have infections for many years uh, and then the infections returned. And again, these are in various parts of Africa. I'll show you a map in a moment uh, where these are taking place. So of course this latest outbreak has galvanized world attention to this virus. It has made everyone realize that a virus in Africa is really everyone's problem, and as a consequence, uh, a lot of people are, are watching Ebola viruses now. So these are the places in the world where we've, we've seen uh, these viruses. In fact, of course, the main numbers are in Africa uh, and parts of Central Africa, shown here on the right, DRC, uh, Republic of the Congo, Gabon, Sudan, Uganda, with various different uh, Ebola viruses shown here in different colors. And of course, the latest outbreak, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, the one virus isolate from Thai forest. Uh, then we have imported cases in the US. These are all rest and importations and red shown here. We have had subsequently other uh, importations of Ebola we'll talk about in a bit. Another importation of rest in, in Italy. And here's the Philippines where the virus uh, was found on pig farms and also in one monkey facility, yeah. Right. But it seems here that from what you're saying that it does stay in humans and that we're finding that, for example, the rest in strain like all the way over in other places as well. So each of these outbreaks is a reintroduction of the virus into people. All right. So all the human outbreaks in Africa start with a single introduction from an animal. It spreads among people and then it dies out. It always fizzles out. It never continues. And then when there's another outbreak, it's another spillover. It's so, like a totally different virus then, right? Well, like not well, it's not totally different. It's actually similar. But yes, you can see nucleotide sequence differences in the, in the virus that comes out in, in two years, for example. So it's not exactly the same virus. There, there are different sources. But it, you know, for the most part, we can say it's Zaire or Sudan Ebola virus that's infecting these people by sequencing the genome. The Restin is, again, multiple uh, introductions from monkeys into people and the virus itself is in, in pig farms. So that's the characteristic of this infection actually that it is a classic zoonosis as we talked about them. It's a dead-end infection in people. It may spread for a while but it always uh, fizzles out. Now these are BSL-4 pathogens, biosafety level 4. Now, in, starting uh, in the 70s, we realized that to work on some viruses, you need high containment facilities uh, because the virus may kill at high rates. Uh, it spreads from person to person. Uh, 
and we don't have any vaccines or antivirals, so if you worked on it in a regular lab and get infected, there's nothing we can do. So laboratories are built, which are basically concrete bunkers within a larger building, and they're sealed, the airflow is filtered, and to work in them you have to use these suits um, which in which are, the air is filtered, you have air delivered through this red tube, and it goes in there. You have double gloves and so forth. So I had the opportunity to visit one of these in Boston. There's a BSL-4 that was just constructed. It's not yet open, but it should be opening soon. We made a one-hour documentary where we went through this whole facility and uh, saw how it worked. We went behind the scenes and looked at all the equipment. So this is how we study Ebola viruses and other uh, highly lethal viruses. They're very expensive to maintain, but you can get a lot of information from them. And a lot of the work I'm going to tell you about today uh, challenges of animals, for example, to test vaccines. They have to be done in these kinds of facilities. You can't work with Ebola virus, you know, up in my lab at, at Columbia. So just remember that when we go through work, that it all is very difficult to do. As they said to me in this facility, nothing happens quickly in a BSL-4. Uh, it's, it's very slow and it's very uh, methodical. You can't even go into one on your own. You have to take someone with you because if you pass out, by the time someone came in from the outside, they wouldn't be able to uh, rescue you. So it's quite an interesting way to work. So here's a phylogenetic tree of the Ebola viruses and Marburg viruses. These are two genera within the family Filoviridae. They're called filoviruses because they look thread-like. Uh, they have an unusual filamentous morphology. One genus, Marburg virus, has a single type of virus, Lake Victoria Marburg virus, and these are different strains isolated from the different outbreaks. They are clearly uh, filoviruses like Ebola viruses, but they're distinct. They have slightly different disease patterns, and uh, so they're a separate genus. Here are the Ebola virus genus, and this comprises the viruses we've talked about, Zaire, Bundibugyo, Ivory Coast, uh, Sudan, and Reston. And you can see by this alignment, for example, that Ivory Coast and Bundibugyo have a common ancestor not too far from it. And it's quite interesting that Sudan and, and Reston are the most similar, despite the fact that Reston appears to have originated uh, in the Philippines. All right, so that's the family. This is how we call them, Reston Ebola virus, Sudan Ebola virus, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> So that's what the virus looks like. We've seen this before. This is actually a picture drawn to scale of all, many of the viruses that we've talked about in this course. Uh, here is a, a, a vaccinia or var variola virus, that smallpox virus right there, herpes virus, we've talked about rabies, measles, uh, HIV, SARS, influenza, adenovirus, and rotavirus, and finally papillomas, hep C, hepatitis B, hep A, and polio and parvoviruses, the smallest ones that we've talked about. So the Ebola viruses are quite long. There are, they can be up to 1,000 nanometers in length. Their diameter, though, 80 nanometers, is on the order of many of these other viruses. Um, so in, in diameter, they're not huge, but they are long. And of course, this slide doesn't include the uh, giant viruses that we've talked about, the Mimi viruses, the Pandora viruses, which are over 1,500, can be over 1,500 uh, nanometers in length. So they would obscure this entire slide. All right, so that gives you an idea of the size. And in fact, under the right conditions, you can actually see these uh, on the light microscope. So these are negative stranded RNA viruses. Now, immediately, a number of things should pop into your head when I tell you it's negative stranded. The first is that the RNA in the virus particle is going to be coated with a protein and it's going to bring in the enzyme to the, to the cell with it, right? It's going to bring in an RNA polymerase because the negative strand cannot be translated on its own. So here in this diagram in the upper right, there is our negative stranded RNA coated uh, with proteins. Um, there are two different ones that coat the RNA, the NP uh, and the VP30 protein. Uh, then at one end of the particle here, you can see the polymerase, the larger protein. And then there's a second protein associated with it that's required for RNA synthesis. So the RNA takes up most of the filamentous virus particle. You can see in this electron micrograph the typical filamentous shape. This is unusual for an animal virus, but there are bacterial viruses that are filamentous like this. And they often bend back on themselves and, and make these unusual shapes that you can see here. So the virus is, um, it's got its, its negative strand RNA complex with protein, and then it's in an envelope particle where the envelope, of course, is derived from the host cell. 
It has glycoprotein in it that is, mediates attachment to the host cell. Uh, and beneath the membrane is uh, a series of proteins. The main protein is the matrix protein, or VP40 as it's called, the blue one. And then interspersed, there's a more rare protein called VP24. Both of these make this structural layer below the membrane and give the particle some rigidity. So here on the bottom is the negative stranded RNA. Um, it's quite long, over 17,000 bases in length, and it includes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, mRNAs, each of which give rise to a protein. So the strategy for decoding this genome is to make subgenomic mRNAs. There are other strategies that could be used, but this is a typical one for negative strand viruses with a long uh, negative strand, a single negative strand in the particle. <clears throat> So when this particle, uh, when this RNA gets into a cell, it is decoded into individual mRNAs, which are capped and polyadenylated, and each of those give rise to a different protein. So here, for example, we have the nucleoprotein, which is one of the proteins coding the RNA, uh, VP35, which is a part of the polymerase complex, but also has another function. Many of these Ebola virus proteins are multifunctional. They have a function in the virus particle, but now they have another function which typically is antagonizing the immune response. So VP35, while part of the RNA synthesis machinery, is also an interferon antagonist. I'll tell you how that works in a moment. Uh, VP40 is encoded by this mRNA. That's the matrix protein that lines beneath the membrane. That's also an interferon antagonist. Here's the glycoprotein mRNA. The glycoprotein, of course, is the protein in the membrane. That's also a uh, interferon antagonist. <clears throat> Here's VP30, uh, which is uh, part of the nucleoprotein, along with NP. Uh, this is required for RNA synthesis. And finally, VP24, which is the other protein beneath the membrane, also an interferon antagonist. So we have one, two, three, four proteins in this relatively simple genome that are dedicated to antagonizing interferon. So this is possibly one of the reasons why these viruses are so pathogenic. And how they overwhelm the host so effectively is because they encode so many proteins uh, that antagonize the immune response. All right, finally we have the polymerase here. The L protein is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of the virus. Uh, it's the largest protein. Of course, it has to be brought in with the virus particle. Uh, so that the negative strand genome can be copied to form mRNAs. So here we have a replication cycle of Ebola viruses. And many aspects of this we've actually talked about a little before. Here's on the left, we start with attachment uh, of the virus particles to cell surface receptors. We actually don't know what the receptor on the cell surface is for Ebola virus. Nevertheless, it's taken up into the endocytic pathway. And in the endosome, in the late endosome, it binds to a fusion protein called NPC1, which is a cholesterol transporter. And that gets the nucleocapsid into the cytoplasm. So it's a fusion step. Now we're looking at just the nucleocapsid, the RNA protein complex that's in the VR and the membrane is gone. We have nucleocapsid, negative stranded RNA, which is in the cytoplasm, and that on its own can make mRNAs because it has a polymerase uh, par as part of it. So mRNAs can be made, they can be translated by host cell ribosomes to make the various uh, viral proteins. And of course some of these proteins will go on, uh, the VP35 for example, and L protein will go on and replicate the genome through a full length plus stranded uh, intermediate, so you get lots of new nucleocapsids. Uh, the glycoprotein will be shipped up to the plasma membrane via the uh, vesicular transport pathway. Uh, VP40, the main matrix protein that will be underneath the viral membrane, gets transported on vesicles uh, to the plasma membrane. And eventually, uh, new virus particles formed by budding. The nucleocapsids that are first formed seem to bind to lipid rafts, and these are the sites of assembly of new virus particles by budding. Now, all this, so all this happens in the cytoplasm. One of the characteristics of um, infection in a cell is, is the development of what are called inclusion formations. And these are sites of 
assembly probably of nucleocapsids. And you can see in the cytoplasm of an infected cell, uh, lots of nucleocapsids ready to, uh, to bud out. Okay, so that's the infectious cycle. It should all make perfect sense to you because, again, you know all the fundamentals of this from what we've talked about so far. Now, I was lucky to get an electron micrograph from a scientist at Rocky Mountain Labs, which is an NIH facility in Hamilton, Montana. Very beautiful place, small town. They have this laboratory there, which has a BSL-4 facility. And they have gotten, um, they've studied Ebola viruses as well as many other viruses as well. This is in a cell infected with an isolate from Mali. It's, it's the current strain from the current outbreak. And a couple of interesting things you can see here, virus particles budding, right, from the cell surface. So here's the infected cell on the left. You can see mitochondria, for example, in here, and various vesicles. So here are virus particles budding. Uh, there are a few completed particles, like this one here with the looped end, uh, and these up here have already budded off. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out to you is you can see in the infected cell all the nucleocapsids, so these streaky-looking long things. These are viral nucleocapsids. That's RNA plus the proteins. So the, the NP, the N protein, the polymerase, etc. All of that assembled together makes these nucleocapsids in the cytoplasm and they're migrating towards uh, the plasma membrane so that they can acquire a membrane. Do you think that these nucleocapsids are just diffusing towards the membrane? No. Right. They're probably moving on microtubules. And, and being actively transported. Nothing diffuses around in a cell. You can also see intracellular vacuoles such as this one. Maybe this is actually just um, a junction between two cells where there's some virus particles that have come out and uh, are stuck between the two cells. And here you can see some more nucleocapsids in the other cell. So quite an interesting um, replication cycle. Now, as I said, a, a number of these proteins, four, antagonize immune responses, and the focus is on innate immune responses, particularly the interferons and the interferon-stimulated proteins. So this is a slide which we saw a long time ago when it was still cold, uh, and this has to do with the innate immune response, and here we're looking at a cell with interferon receptors, receptors for type 1 and type 2 uh, interferons, and you remember when a virus infection is sensed, either by sensing RNA or protein. The cell produces interferons. Uh, these bind to interferon receptors, and they initiate a signaling pathway, a phosphorylation cascade, uh, that ends up uh, sending activated transcription proteins into the nucleus, and then the transcription of various cytokines and interferon-stimulated genes. And these interferon-stimulated genes are the ones with antiviral activities, right? So two proteins of uh, Ebola virus, VP24 and VP40, which have other functional roles in the virus, these also have antagonistic activities against this pathway. So, for example, VP40 uh, antagonizes JAK1. JAK1 is a protein kinase that, when interferon binds to its receptor, initiates this signaling cascade to turn on ISG synthesis. So VP40 inhibits that by binding to this uh, kinase and inhibiting it from phosphorylating the next protein down in the cascade. So in other words, in the presence of VP40, you can't make ISGs very effectively. <clears throat> uh, the, the target of, of JAK is, is a STAT protein, STAT1 and 2. These get phosphorylated, they dimerize and go in the nucleus. VP24, another structural protein of the virus, binds to STAT1 and inhibits its, uh, its translocation into the nucleus. So STAT1 ends up staying in the cytoplasm. It can't go in the nucleus where it would be activating uh, a number of genes that are needed for an efficient interferon response. Okay, so two uh, antagonisms at the level of downstream interferon effects, the synthesis of ISGs and cytokines. You may remember also this slide. This is a picture of how Viral RNAs are sensed as foreign by two cytoplasmic proteins, Rig I and MDA5. Again, these sit in the cytoplasm. They recognize either double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA with a 5' prime phosphate. These are types of molecules that we don't see in uninfected cells. So they're signatures for viral infections. And Rig I uh, 
in MDA5, when they detect these molecules, they also initiate a phosphorylation cascade, which is very complicated. Eventually ends up sending, again, transcription proteins into the nucleus, IRF3 or NF-kappa B, and that turns on the synthesis of cytokines, the ones that cause inflammation and so forth. Yeah. In obese people, you see double-stranded RNAs? Do you know anything about that, Dr. Silverstein? I know nothing of that. So this is Dr. Silverstein, my colleague, who used to teach this course with me, and he stopped a couple years ago. Well, we, he used to come to every lecture, and, I, and if I got questions I couldn't ask, I would ask him. So I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll look into it. What would be the source of these double-stranded RNAs? Yeah, I, I didn't really force that. Yeah, and what the effect would be to turn on interferon, yeah. and this would be bad. So, you know, there's a connection between certain um, kinds of obesity and adenovirus infections, which also generate double-stranded RNA. So that could be part of it as well. Okay, so um, VP35, another Ebola virus protein, binds double-stranded RNA. Actually, the structure of VP35 uh, bound to double-stranded RNA has been solved, showing exactly how this sequesters it. And of course, you bind double-stranded RNA, and it can't activate Rig I, uh, MDA5 in this case, and that will also block uh, the interferon response. So um, it's another way that uh, the virus is antagonizing uh, innate immunity. <clears throat> And finally, you may remember uh, we talked about tetherin. Tetherin is a cell protein shown here uh, bound to the plasma membrane. It's an interferon-induced antiviral protein. And it's shown here holding HIV particles to the plasma membrane. So here the HIV particles are forming by budding, uh, but they attach to tetherin, and that holds the virus particles from moving away. This is a an antiviral defense, not just for HIV, but for Ebola virus and other envelope viruses. The HIV genome encodes an antagonist. Uh, we talked about VPU is a protein of HIV-1 that antagonizes tetherin, which allows the virus to replicate. The Ebola virus glycoprotein antagonizes tetherin, allowing uh, the virus particles to form. So these are just four different mechanisms of immune antagonism. Again, they're very specific, and they no doubt uh, result in uh, the virus being more virulent. In fact, you can take away some of these proteins or alter them, and the virus has uh, reduced virulence. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a little bit of overview on how this virus replicates. Now let's talk about how you get infected with these viruses. So as I said, it's a classic zoonosis. The virus comes from some animal reservoir and infects people. There's typically an index case, and sometimes we have evidence that that index case, in other words, the index case starts an epidemic, that index has contact with an animal of some kind. We, sometimes we have documentation of that, but not always. And typically it's contact with bushmeat. In these parts of Africa where uh, these outbreaks occur, People hunt wild game to eat. They, they hunt monkeys of various sorts. Uh, if they find dead chimpanzees in the forest, they will consume it. They also hunt bats. And we think these are some of the sources of uh, Ebola virus. So the index case, the virus spills over from an animal reservoir into people. Uh, it incubates in that index case, and then it spreads to other people by close contact uh, with infected fluids. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but the chains of infection are quite short. When you do uh, case tracing, you can go into an epidemic, find an infected individual, and figure out who he or she has infected. It's called tracing the chain of transmission. It's not very long for Ebola virus. There's maybe three uh, transmissions at the maximum, index number one and number two. It doesn't go on and on and on as, say, influenza virus. So short chains of transmission, so this is interruptible. And in many of the previous outbreaks, we've been very good at interrupting the chain of transmission. The uh, reproductive index for this virus is about two. So that's the number of people who are, uh, who one sick person will infect on the average. All right, this is an average number because obviously 
Some people can be super spreaders and infect more people, other people can infect less. But these are some examples of R0 values. I've mentioned this a few times in this course. So for example, the most contagious virus that we've talked about is measles virus with an R0 of about 15 or 18. So one measles virus infected person on average infects 15 to 18 others. Here we have mumps, which is 10, SARS is 4, uh, HIV is 4, Ebola is 2 and hepatitis C virus is two. And to spread effectively, you've got to be more than one. If you're one or less, you're never going to spread in a population. Are these dependent on the type of population? Absolutely, absolutely. This can vary um, in different populations. Obviously, the Ebola populations have been limited, but you know, measles and HIV, this is a global average. But if you look in individual areas, it can, it can have a range, yeah. So where is the virus coming from? Marburg virus has been isolated from this bat, Rusetus aegypticus. Um, the actual infectious virus has been isolated in cell culture. Okay? So this looks like, for that, vir uh, for that virus anyway, that a bat or some species of bats in the forest are the reservoir species. As far as we can tell, uh, the virus doesn't affect the bats. Uh, and then it can get into monkeys. So remember, the, the outbreak in Marburg was by importing monkeys from Uganda. So somehow those monkeys were infected from the bat, probably, and then it infects the people. Or you could get direct uh, infection from a bat. There are a couple of instances of Marburg infection where people go into caves where bats live, and they, they get infected uh, as well. So for Marburg, it looks pretty good that uh, some kind of bat is, is the reservoir species from where it spills over then into other animals. It's not so clear cut for Ebola viruses. So for Zaire, the first strain identified, and the one where we have the most information, pieces of viral RNA have been found in bats by polymerase chain reaction. No one's got infectious virus from a bat. All right, and they've also found antibodies in bats, but we're only talking about a few uh, isolations. There are three different species of tree roosting bats, not cave dwelling bats. Uh, where we get pieces of RNA and antibodies, but again, we don't get infectious virus. So you could be skeptical and say, we don't really know. It's got to be somewhere out there, but we're not quite sure because I think the gold standard is to have infectious virus. The people I know who work on this and actually go and sample, they say, you know, it's very hard to collect bats and get virus from them. It's easier to do PCR. So I, I respect that and I understand that, but I think until we have virus, it's going to be a little bit up in the air. So assume that bats are, are harboring Ebola viruses in addition to Marburg. We know that these animals can be infected, <clears throat> and they're probably dead-end hosts. Humans, of course, we have outbreaks. Gorillas and chimpanzees are clearly infected. We do uh, find dead animals in the woods. Chimpanzees, for sure. Gorillas are suspected to be infected. Um, it's very difficult to find gorilla carcasses after they die in the woods. They're cleared very quickly. So uh, it's, I don't think anyone has any virus from any of these animals. Uh, but in fact, in part, the gorilla reduction in population in Africa is thought to be in part by infections with uh, Ebola viruses. So there is an animal reservoir, possibly a bat. It seems to then spill over periodically into humans, maybe via chimps or gorillas or even uh, directly from bats, because again, Bushmeat involves getting bats, gorillas, and chimpanzees, among other monkeys. So here's a, a picture that kind of summarizes this idea. The idea is that the reservoirs are, are, are bat species, maybe multiple species of bats. Uh, and these viruses are maintained in the bats at a certain level. We don't know if they're always there. So we don't have really good population studies of these viruses in bats. This is something that needs to be done. We don't know if, if it's constantly present or if there are periodic um, resurgences of the virus in bats. You know, we don't have an outbreak constantly of Ebola in Africa. It's periodic. So it could be one hypothesis is that uh, the, the bat populations periodically are, start to replicate the virus on what trigger we don't know, and then it spills over into people. So we need to really do a lot more work on the bats. We don't know how it's spread among the bats uh, as well. But again, periodically, the idea is that from bats, it can go into uh, non-human species like chimps and gorillas and maybe other animals out there that we don't know about. Um, these, these individuals can pass the virus among themselves. So that's the red arrow. 
so chimps can pass it to other chimps, as we saw for uh, SIV. Gorillas can pass it to other gorillas and so forth, and there, there's most likely some spread between these animals as well. And then the humans intervene at some point. They may be infected uh, from these other mammals, or they can get virus uh, directly from a bat. So this is the idea at the moment. It's by no means proven, although you might read stories saying that this is proven, the bat is the reservoir. I think we need to do a lot more work before uh, we really nail this down. <clears throat> so here are two examples of outbreaks where we do know uh, the origin or the, the index case and we, we have a good idea of how infection started. So Gabon 1996, Zaire, Ebola virus, 37 cases. Um, this, in this case, it was initiated by eating a, a, a dead chimpanzee that a number of individuals found in the woods. They were hunting for food. They found this dead chimp. They ate it. And 18 people who were involved in butchering the animal became ill. And then they infected their family members, and, and that spread uh, the infection. In this one, in Gabon, in, in 1996, again, Zaire, 60 cases. The index case was a hunter. Uh, who lived in a forest camp, so he didn't claim to have hunted any animals, but a dead chimp was found uh, nearby, nearby his camp, and there was Ebola virus in that chimp. So the possibility was that somehow he got infected uh, either via the chimp or a bat that had infected the chimp. So these are examples of where we know uh, that there was some kind of contact with an infected animal. We don't have this for every case uh, by any means. <clears throat> This is an early uh, epidemiological tracing of the current outbreak, which, as you know, uh, emerged in Guinea here uh, in this red area and then spread to Sierra Leone and Liberia. And these are countries that had never had outbreaks of Ebola virus before. And this uh, actually began in December of 2013. Is that 2013? Yes, 2013. This was a two-year-old child who uh, got sick and four days after getting sick died. Right there, we don't know how this child acquired infection. It may likely have been bushmeat. I mean, I heard some rumors, but you, uh, I don't see anything concrete in press. So this is December 2013. Uh, this child then passed it on to his sister, his mother, his grandmother, a nurse, and a village midwife. And then they, the midwife passed it to other people, uh, a number of these individuals. So the sister of um, the grandmother here passed it to other families, uh, health care members. And you can see the chain of infection. They actually traced this 20 or so cases initially. It started in this village, Gwikadu, and then eventually spread uh, to other neighboring villages as well. So it all began with a single spillover. And from that spillover, from an animal presumably, it went through this chain of transmission from person to person, mainly family members and healthcare workers who were treating uh, the sick individuals. And from here, it then spread throughout uh, all three countries. And part of the problem was this was not recognized in December as Ebola virus. It was thought to be malaria or something else. And it was actually months, it wasn't until March of 2014 that uh, the WHO received notification from these countries that they had an Ebola virus outbreak. And so by then, you can see, here we have February, March, um, February, January. By then, the virus had spread extensively. And that's why this outbreak, in part, uh, was so difficult to contain. Because by the time we picked it up, it had spread extensively. These countries had zero experience in dealing with Ebola virus outbreaks. A lot of other countries, Uganda, DRC, etc., had lots of experience by now. They knew how to contain an outbreak, but these, these countries didn't, and that's why this got to be so big, 26,000 infections. Now, this is a map of Africa showing the range of the bats, the three bat species that have been found positive for Ebola virus RNA and have had antibodies in them. This is their geographic range, and the map is colored uh, indicating the risk for infection depending on the range of these animals. So red is, is the highest risk uh, and blue is the least risk. So you can see much of Africa, these animals don't live, these bats don't live there, and so there's very little risk. But there are pockets of risk areas uh, throughout the country. But here in Central Africa, uh, especially DRC and neighboring countries, there's a lot of risk. Uh, 
And you can see the countries in Western Africa as well, uh, where these bats are known to inhabit, are high risk also. Uh, on the top is the population of each of these countries. You see DRC has the highest population. Uh, the, the others are substantially smaller. In the same article where this comes from, they also look at the amount of travel in and out of these countries. There's lots of air travel from and to all of these at-risk countries. So you know, the possibility of, of global spread is, is much greater than uh, we thought. Now this, of course, assumes that those three bats are the only species. And it may be that there are other reservoirs that w as well that we don't know about. But you can see that at least from this approximation, these are the areas that have to be uh, vigilant. It might make sense to immunize uh, the people in these at-risk areas at some point when we have a vaccine. But you know, we have millions of people here uh, and someone will have to pay for this vaccine. It's not yet licensed yet, but this is a viable option at some point to prevent uh, these infections. How does it get transmitted? So remember, it comes from an animal to a human. A human consumes meat. They presumably contaminate themselves by, by uh, you know, dressing the carcass or, or uh, preparing it, and the, the virus gets into a cut or a mucous membrane. But then it goes from person to person. And the way we think that happens is by contact with infected blood or body fluid. So there's lots of virus in the blood. Other fluids that have been shown to have virus include urine, saliva, sweat, feces, vomit, breast milk, and semen. And this is from someone who's either sick, very sick, or has died. If you're not sick, if you're just incubating the virus, uh, we don't know of any example of transmission from an individual like that. So any of these body fluids can uh, transmit infection. You can also have uh, transmission by contact with contaminated objects. There's been some outbreaks where contaminated blankets or bed clothes uh, have been associated with infection. Needles and syringes are a big one in hospitals where they use glass uh, syringes and, and reusable needles. They don't autoclave them properly and they transmit infection. Many chains of infection have been traced through such contaminated material. It's not transmitted by insects. It is not transmitted by water or food or long distance aerosols. So I bring back this picture which we looked at before of aerosol transmission. Remember when you talk or speak or sneeze or cough, you make droplets of different sizes. You make really, really small droplets that can go long distances, you know, up to 150 or so feet. And that's what we call aerosol transmission. The respiratory viruses like influenza and measles get transmitted this way. That is not the way Ebola virus is transmitted. It doesn't have the capacity to go long distance in small drops. We don't know why. It could be that the, the virus isn't stable enough or there isn't enough virus, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, the way it works is either by contact or by short distance aerosols. So for example, <clears throat> if you're right in front of a patient with Ebola and they sneeze or cough in your face or within a few feet, they could transmit it by big droplets. That's not what we consider to be the, the classical aerosol transmission, but it can happen. Some uh, ER physician was telling me when you intubate a patient, you generate an aerosol. And if that patient has Ebola and you're not protected, you can be uh, infected. So you can get short range infections by these big droplets, even huge droplets like would be generated in vomiting, uh, but not long distance aerosol transmission. Now, this became an issue in this current outbreak. Here's a op-ed in the Times, September, well, it's September 11th. Maybe he did that on purpose. But uh, this is Michael Osterholm, who is a epidemiologist, preparedness uh, type of person. He's at the University of Minnesota, so he wants uh, the world to be prepared for pandemics. So he wrote this op-ed saying, that virologists are afraid to talk about the possibility that Ebola virus could mutate to become transmissible through the air. And his argument was the virus hyper-evolution is unprecedented. There's been more transmission in this past outbreak than we ever saw before. And all it takes is a few mutations and breathing would put one at risk of contracting Ebola. Infections could spread quickly like flu. So I read this and I was pretty much pissed off because he is just scaring people. Most of what he says is wrong here. Um, he, we have no idea what mutations it would take. He says almost with certainty certain mutations occurred 
we have no idea if you need one or 50. And we would have no idea about its transmissibility. So I wrote a response to this, which uh, you should take a look at. I'll show it to you in a minute. Unfortunately, the press picked this up. So here's Time Magazine. The Ebola virus is mutating, say, scientists. Uh, scientists would like to study whether it had become more contagious. So all of a sudden this was dominating headlines, this idea that the virus is mutating and it's going to become aerosolized, right? Um, so I think he did a disservice by, by talking about this because it's, it's so remote uh, as to be highly unlikely. And why do I say that? This is, you can go read this, my, my whole article, but basically the virus is always mutating like all viruses do, like I've taught you in this course. But whether the mutation gives rise to something that will change the virus phenotypically, we don't know. Osterholm was saying just because it's mutating during this big transmission through the population means by definition it's going to change, but that's not necessarily going to happen. The other thing is, in all the years we've been looking at viruses, 100 years or so of studying viruses, we have never seen a virus change the way it's transmitted. Okay. We have never seen HIV change from sexual IV drug use transmission to any other route. Flu is transmitted by aerosol. It never changes to fecal oral. Polio is transmitted fecal orally. It doesn't change to aerosol transmission. Now, you can never say something is never going to happen, right? Especially with viruses. But what we can do is see what's happened and make intelligent um, conclusions. And I would say that if you've never seen it happen, then the likelihood that the virus is going to change the way it's transmitted is pretty low. Okay, so he scared a lot of people and the Times published a number of articles on this and so forth. But just recently a couple of papers have come out. You don't have to believe me. Let's just see what the papers say. Here's one in virology. Ebola virus is evolving but not changing. No evidence for functional change in the virus from 1976 to the current outbreak. So what they did is they took sequences of all these viruses over the years and they did some computational analysis. We find none of the amino acid replacements lead to identifiable functional changes. They have minimal effect on protein structure, being neither stabilizing nor destabilizing, not found in regions associated with known functions, tend to cluster in poorly constrained regions, disordered regions of the protein. We find no evidence that the difference between the current and previous outbreaks is due to evolutionary changes associated with transmission. Instead, epidemiological factors are likely to be responsible for the unprecedented spread. So everybody wants to blame the virus. The virus is mutating. It's going to go airborne. It's going to get more virulent. But in fact, it's really about the population that the virus is in the end. And this was virulent because of the particular factors uh, that were involved that I've already told you about. So I think this and other studies really put to rest this uh, idea of aerosol transmission. Now, in the laboratory, you can get Ebola to transmit by an aerosol. I don't know if you've seen one of these. This is a nebulizer. So if you have to inhale a drug, you put it in here, and you put the mask on your face, and you turn it on, and it makes a mist. It's an aerosol. If you hold up this, this nebulizer, it would go all over. It makes very small droplets, right? So if you put Ebola virus into this machine and then put the mask on the face of a primate, guess what? the primate gets infected. You're infecting the primate by aerosol. You're dumping tons of virus right into uh, the respiratory tract. So no one's tried to make, create an aerosol in a room and see if the primates are infected. That's a pretty dangerous experiment that probably no one wants to propose. But some other things have been done. First of all, if you, if you, so you can infect macaques artificially by an aerosol but it's short range, you're putting the mask right on their face. If you inoculate macaques intramuscularly, uh, you can find virus in oral and nasal swabs, but if you put those animals in a room with other caged animals, they don't transmit to, to animals housed in separate cages. So it doesn't look like they generate an aerosol that can transmit. And another experiment, they infected pigs through the nose with Zaire Ebola virus. Then they put them in a room uh, they were on the pigs were on the floor running around, and in the room were cages with macaques, and all the macaques got infected. So you'll see this quoted by a lot of sources saying this is evidence that Ebola virus spreads by aerosol. But this experimental design tells you nothing. Let's look at how this experiment was done. So here's a room with pigs, and here are the cages up here that actually you can't see them, they're high up. And the airflow was designed to move the air from the bottom to the top. 
So they infect the pigs, uh, they, they get virus in them, and then these macaques all got infected. Every night, someone comes into this room and mops the floor, well, because the pigs are shitting all over the floor, right? So someone mops the floor. Guess what happens when you mop the floor? You're making an aerosol. If there's any virus in the feces or urine, you're going to bring it all up. So this is really not a conclusive experiment uh, because of the way it's designed. All it says is that these pigs can make virus. They probably shed it in urine and feces, and then uh, it gets popped up into the air. But whether they ex exhale it in their breath and transmit it, we have no idea uh, from this experiment. OK, enough about aerosol transmission. Uh, let's talk about the disease. We can make conclusions about how the disease uh, proceeds by observations in humans. We have non-human primates that we infect. We have rodents of various sorts, guinea pigs, mice, and hamsters. The rodent experiments require you to passage the virus and adapt it to the rodent so it will infect them. And these have a little less weight, I think, in terms of, of what's going on. Uh, it enters through mucosal surfaces in people, breaks or abrasions in the skin, uh, parenteral contaminated needles, and the virus is in a lot of body fluids, uh, and that's why you can get it in this way. So, you know, for a while there was a big discussion, can you get Ebola virus if it lands on your skin? And I said, no, unless you have a cut. Remember, the outer layer of skin is dead, but most of us do have cuts on our hands or elsewhere, and so it can get in uh, via these cuts. There's an incubation period of 2 to 21 days during which you are not contagious. You, you don't need to be quarantined. And you have a set of early symptoms, fever, headache, muscle pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and stomach pain. So these are early symptoms where if a person came from West Africa and they start displaying these symptoms, boom, they go into isolation. And then at the peak illness, rash, hemorrhage, convulsions, uh, severe disturbances in metabolism. And you have uh, a defect in your blood uh, coagulation system, and that's part of the reason why you, you have a rash and a lot of bleeding. The clinical fe features of this infection show that every system in your body is infected. You have systemic effects, GI, gastrointestinal problems, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You have respiratory symptoms. You have problems with the blood system, not just um, um, coagulation problems, but uh, bleeding in the eyes and so forth, and then you have neurological problems as well. So whether the virus is replicating any, everywhere isn't necessarily needed to do this, but the cytokines and so forth that are produced could account for some of these symptoms. So here is a, a macaque that has been infected um, with Ebola virus, and one of the, some of the manifestations are what we call hemorrhagic you have bleeding, and, and you have bleeding under the skin that gives you these rashes or bruises, they're called petechiae, right? You can see that here in different parts of the animal, bruising at the elbow. Uh, and then you get, if you inject these animals to take blood or give them anything, the venipuncture sites never heal, they keep oozing because of the defect in blood clotting. You can also get hemorrhaging internally in mucosal tissues here, for example, is a hemorrhage um, in uh, the intestine, uh, and I believe this is stomach as well. So the animals, uh, d this is what we see also in people. What we think is the virus uh, enters and initially replicates in immune cells, monocytes, uh, macrophages, and dendritic cells. This replication in these cells, of course, disperses the virus to other places. <clears throat> it establishes a viremia, uh, and that delivers virus to virtually every organ. And in many organs, you have necrosis of the cells that make up the organ, like liver uh, and adrenal and kidney and so forth. The cells are destroyed by virus replication and immune responses, most likely. And that's why you have these multi-system failures as a consequence. Lots of uh, chemokines and cytokines are produced, nitric oxide. These are all toxic. You get uh, loss of dendritic cell function because of the virus replicating in it. Lymphocytes, apoptosis as well. So you have an overall decrease in immune function, and this is probably part of the reason uh, why the infection is so lethal. You have a very substantial viremia. This is a time course of people who were infected with Ebola virus. These were uh, healthcare workers who were known to be infected on this day, and they took blood samples from them at different times uh, after infection. And uh, the black bars are the titers in the blood of people who, who died eventually. And the white bars are people who lived. So you can see very right off the bat, if you have a lot of virus, this is associated with a fatal outcome. But you can see um, here is the day post onset of symptoms. So as soon as you have symptoms, you have a rather low amount of virus, but it goes up 
pretty quickly. So probably before this time, during the incubation period, you simply don't have enough virus uh, to transmit to others. As I said, the virus replicates in lots of tissues and causes necrosis in them. It replicates in lots of different cell types. It has a broad cell tropism. All these cells here are sites of replication. Uh, it destroys the liver. You get elevated liver enzymes in the blood. This leads to shock, which is characteristic of infection, and massive uh, lymphocyte death. Many cytokines and so forth are produced during the course of the infection, especially by uh, infection of macrophages and monocytes. This causes an immune imbalance and contributes to uh, the disease. And as I said, you have impaired vascular and coagulation systems. We think that the virus may replicate in the endothelial cells. So here are some blood vessels. And uh, as I told you a while ago, they're composed of uh, endothelial cells that make the vessel proper. We think the virus is replicating in them and making the vessels permeable and hence some of the bleeding seen with it. Uh, there's also um, abnormalities in the clotting program probably as a consequence of um, certain tissues that make clotting factors being infected and destroyed. So that's why we get the rash which is reflective of bleeding. Um, internal bleeding and hemorrhage as well. However, most of this, most, most of the um, permeability leads to fluid loss and shock. Not, you don't die because you're losing blood, you die because of uh, fluid loss. So if you are infected, uh, there are no antivirals, there are no vaccines yet. The only thing we can do is give you supportive care, and this consists of intravenous fluids, oxygen, uh, and infection control. And we had some experience with um, treating patients here in the U.S., so we learned quite a bit. In Africa, the case fatality ratio is 30 to 90 percent over the history of this infection. We don't know how many inapparent infections there are. There's, there's some evidence that people can get infected, uh, but they don't get sick, so that could bring this down substantially. This is, of course, people get sick, they go to the hospital, they live or they die. That number is biased to the very sick people. But um, treating really brings this down. In the U.S., we've had very good luck with the few patients that we've treated. And I wanted to share you this little piece from the doctor who treated the first two cases in Atlanta. So these were two uh, uh, health care workers who were working in Africa. They got infected, so they were brought to uh, Emory and treated, and they survived. It's a very interesting interview in uh, Scientific American, and they asked him what sort of lessons. And he said, you know, we're not being critical, but they have a lack of infrastructure and testing that everyone in our society takes for granted, like being able to do a blood count. Uh, you couldn't do these simple things in these hospitals. What we found in general is the amount of fluid they lost through diarrhea and vomiting. They have a lot of electrolyte normalities, so replacing that with standard fluids without monitoring will not do a good job of replacing things like sodium and potassium. So they said you have to know exactly what's low in these individuals. So if you can't measure it, which is the problem in Africa, you have to take this into account. Uh, so they also have a lot of fluid in their tissues, the damage to the liver, uh, you, you uh, no longer makes enough protein. Proteins in the blood are very low, so you have to pay attention to this. So the take-home message is very interesting. If you have the diagnostic uh, methods here, you can monitor the patients and, and give them what they need, and they survive. We only lost one patient uh, in, in uh, Texas, and he probably was diagnosed too late. It was too far into the infection. So I think if we can apply this to African outbreaks, this is one of the things we're trying to do. We can uh, get more people to survive. In the U.S., these are the infections we had. Uh, the Liberian man who went to Dallas. So he, he went to the ER with a fever, and they said he had flu, and they sent him home. So that was a big mistake because those two days that he was home probably killed him. So he died. But he infected two healthcare workers in Dallas, and they eventually recovered. They were cared for properly. And here in New York, uh, a doctor at the emergency room in uh, Columbia, he had been working in Guinea, returned to New York, he got sick with Ebola, he recovered as well. So he was treated at Bellevue. So again, not a lot of cases, but I think we have learned the right way to, to care for these individuals without antivirals, just supportive therapy. This can make a big impact on the, the lethality of infection. And finally, I want to end up with some possible therapies that are being developed and may be deployed eventually. Uh, we talked about this in the vaccines lecture. This is a monoclonal antibody or a mixture of monoclonals called ZMAP, uh, which was given to those first two healthcare workers who got infected in Africa, came back to the US. We don't know if it helped them or not, but it's a mixture of three monoclonals 
that are directed against the glycoprotein. Remember, the glycoprotein is in the membrane of the virus. Uh, these uh, mice were immunized with virus-like particles. That means they look like viruses, but they're not infectious. And uh, monoclonals were identified that block infection. They were built into a human antibody scaffold. And the antibodies are produced in tobacco plants. These are the three antibodies binding to the glycoprotein. These protected in the lab non-human primates from infection. They were very effective at doing that. They're currently in phase two studies, which means they're being tested for efficacy uh, in Liberia. But of course, now the disease has gone way down, so it's not clear at all whether we're going to get uh, good information about this. We have a couple of vaccines that are being tested. I want to just tell you a little bit about them. They're quite interesting. Uh, there are two vaccines that use other viruses as carriers of Ebola virus information. We're using adenoviruses and pox viruses, and we put bits of the viral Ebola virus genome into these other viruses and then use these as immunogens. So the first one is an adenovirus vaccine, and what they have, what they have used here is a chimpanzee adenovirus. So there are lots of human adenoviruses that we all get. So we have lots of antibodies against human adenoviruses. So if you give a vaccine using an adenovirus background, it doesn't work well because of our antibodies. But few of us have antibodies against chimpanzee adenoviruses. So uh, they built the Ebola virus glycoprotein into a chimpanzee adenovirus backbone. Uh, and here they give 10 to the 11th uh, PFU as an immunogen of this virus. And then they challenge uh, intramuscularly uh, with Ebola virus. And you get, with 10 to the 11th PFU, 50% of the animals survive. Uh, none of them survive if you give them 10 to the 10th. So this isn't very good because 10 to the 11th is a huge amount of particles. So then they went into a prime boost scenario where you give two injections. And if you just give two injections of the same serotype of chimpanzee adenovirus, uh, you only get 33% protection. So you go in once, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 10, 10 PFP, if you, if you, you wait a couple of weeks to boost, then you challenge with Ebola, 33% protection. They then said, well, maybe you, the, the animals are making antibodies to chimp adenovirus, so let's go in with a different serotype. So they go in with first adenovirus type 3 and then type 63, which will not be neutralized by antibodies to type 3. Um, again, 25% protection, not really very good. So the, the last thing they tried, first boost adenovirus type 3, and then this is a vaccinia virus vector, a totally different virus. This is modified vaccinia and cara. This is a derivative of the uh, vaccine that's used for smallpox. So you immunize first with adenovirus, then with the vaccinia virus, and here you get 100% protection, and this is durable. This lasts uh, for months. So this uh, vaccine is now in, in um, it's either, either phase one has been completed, I think I have it on a chart coming up, or, or we're going into phase two. So this one looks pretty promising. <clears throat> the other approach that's, that's going into people as well is to use vesicular stomatitis as a vector, BSV related to rabies virus. It's a bullet-shaped virus with a negative strand genome. What you do is you take out the VSV glycoprotein gene and you substitute the Ebola virus gene into this virus. And you can construct this by uh, transfection of cells by, uh, by recombinant plasmids. The, the point is you get a virus out that is all uh, VSV except the glycoprotein is Ebola virus. And then you inoculate these uh, into your animals and you see if it gives protectin. So that result is shown here on the next slide. Uh, this is a a vaccine being developed in Canada with a company. So these uh, animals have been uh, vaccinated, those are the diamonds, uh, with that VSV recombinant, and then they're challenged with 1,000 PFU intranasally, and, and this is the survival. So all of these animals survive, and if you just give the animals vector alone without Ebola glycoprotein, just give them VSV with no Ebola glycoprotein, they all die. So this looks very protective as well, and this is also uh, been put into people. And the last one I want to tell you about is one that was just published. It's quite interesting. This is one which is a Ebola virus whole virus vaccine. They take Ebola virus and they delete the VP30 gene from the genome. They actually put in a, 
substitute gene, green fluorescent protein, so they can track the virus. So VP30 uh, is a protein that's associated with the nucleocapsid. Okay, so this is essential for infectivity. So they basically take RNA, they delete the VP30 gene, and then they take the RNA and they put it into cells that produce VP30. So now you make particles, the genome of these particles lacks the VP30 gene, right? So you grow the virus in cells that produce VP30, you have VP30 in the particle, but that virus does not make new particles in a cell because it doesn't have VP30. So you can infect cells with this VP30 deleted virus. It is antigenic, but it doesn't replicate and it's non-infectious. And in fact, you don't have to work with this virus under BSL-4 conditions because it can't infect cells. So this has been used to immunize uh, synomologous macaques. Uh, here we're immunizing intramuscularly and then challenging intramuscularly with just a thousand fo focus units of uh, Ebola virus, not very much. So these are animals that didn't get any vaccine. These, the graph shows you uh, virus replication in red. A lot of virus present up to 10 to the 8th, 50% uh, tissue culture infectious doses in all four animals and none of these animals survived. So these were not immunized, so they died. Uh, here are animals that got one dose of this vaccine, 10 to the seventh focus units. Uh, four out of the four survived. One of them developed a, a transient viremia. And if you give two doses, uh, all the animals survive and you get no viremia. So again, this is a VSV, uh, sorry, this is a Ebola virus vaccine lacking that single gene, which makes it non-infectious, but it's clearly immunogenic. So this is not replicating, but it's getting into cells, it's, it's generating an immune response. So at the moment, these are the vaccines that are being tested. The chimpanzee adenovirus uh, just completed a phase one, both at NIH and in other countries, in Mali, Switzerland. The VSV that I told you about is, in, is just uh, finished phase one. These are all done at very diff at different sites. So phase one is just a safety test to make sure that the vaccine is safe, doesn't have bad side effects. Uh, here, is the, um, here is another version of the AD26 uh, vaccinia, which is also in phase one. Um, recombinant protein, which I didn't talk about, is in phase one. Uh, an, an, another phase two study of the chimpanzee adenovirus um, is, is uh, ongoing in all these countries. And you can see uh, others are, uh, these phase three are, are obviously planned. Um, March 2015, we're past that. I'm not sure that any of these have gone forward because um, there's not much infection anymore. So if you don't have people being infected, it's very difficult to test the efficacy of the vaccine. And it's really not worth to uh, spend the money on doing that unless you can get an efficacy result. We, also, we already know that these are safe in people. The real question is whether uh, they are protective or not. So that's a very tough uh, nut to crack. How do you test these vaccines? We have a few antivirals that are being tested. Uh, there's one which is an RNA polymerase inhibitor for influenza. It's, it's licensed for flu in some countries. It seems to have some activity against Ebola. Uh, it's in a phase two study in Guinea at the moment. Uh, a small interfering RNA is in a phase, phase two. This is directed against the viral genome, so it would prevent infection. And then a nucleoside analog, which has some broad spectrum activity, is in phase one in the UK. So you can see there's lots of activity all of a sudden stimulated by this uh, latest outbreak. So if we learned anything from this, I think the biggest thing we learned is that every infectious disease is everybody's problem. There aren't diseases restricted to one place or another because people travel and diseases spread. People were very afraid of Ebola spreading globally. The interesting thing is that these vaccines and antivirals have been ready for some time. The US military and the military of other countries actually developed them in case of a bioterrorism attack using Ebola virus, but they never got into the human clinical trials. And of course, what stimulated that now is the outbreak uh, in Africa. So I think this tells us we need to be ready for the viruses that we think are lethal and are likely to spread. We should have been ready for Ebola a long time ago, but the individuals who make decisions about what's going to be developed felt it would never be a global problem. So predicting is always difficult, right? I think you need to be ready. And the interesting question, of course, is which viruses, which other viruses do we need to be ready for? Besides Ebola, Nipah, Hendra, MERS, SARS, avian influenza. I mean, there are lots of them out there. The way I see it, 
Lots of jobs for virologists. <laughs>